On my previous video, there was a resounding yes on continuing on with this two-parter. If you haven't already seen the first video, check it out now. And if you have seen it, that means you're coming back to this channel, so remember to subscribe. With that out of the way, it's time to look at one small change I'd make to each Warframe, covering the second half alphabetically, from Mesa all the way to Zephyr. I'm Nick Engineer, let's solve a practical problem. Up first, we have Mesa. Mesa is a powerful Warframe, boasting a 95% damage reduction ability and a literal aimbot for exalted weapon. However, without an augment, her first ability is sorely lacking. On the surface, it suggests it'll store damage equal to how much you deal, multiplied by your strength. In reality, however, that damage storing is first limited to 200 damage per shot, and then further limited to a maximum of 5,000 stored damage. Both of these values are affected by your strength. The limit per shot suggests this ability is for use with high fire rate weapons, but then the damage cap means that it caps in just 25 shots, which high fire rate weapons will do in no time. My one small change will be to remove the maximum damage cap. This leans into the bonus for high fire rate weapons to let them take down priority targets. Build up the damage as high as you want to take it. Next up, we've got Mirage. It's no secret that I hold a serious dislike for the Eclipse ability because it's unreliable. The bonus you get is dependent on the amount of light you are stood in, yet the value on the UI doesn't show what you're actually getting. This even differs based on your settings. My one small change would do away with the whole lighting aspect. It's a neat idea, but this level of inconsistency is not good. Instead, I'd make Eclipse tap cast for the damage buff, or hold cast to swap to the damage reduction buff, with whichever one you have active operating at full power. Following on then, we have Necros. Since the armor reduction changes, Necros has seen increased love for being more than just a glorified resource booster. However, there are still some issues with regards to his shadows. Most notably, they can be an undue drain on allied resources, such as with Oberon's Renewal. My one small change is to simply not have the shadows count against any energy drains or similar resource drains for allied abilities. We retain the healing mechanic for those who want to keep their shadows alive without the anti-synergy that plagues him. Now, Nezha is a frame with very few complaints. He's got tank, crowd control, stasis immunity multiple times over, damage amplification, orb generation, and even the ability to teleport. The one small change I'd make would be to tie his speed boost on his one to strength. Parkour is generally the fastest way to get around for most Warframes, so a little more strength based speed shouldn't be overpowered for our little Nezha here. Nida similarly is in a good spot. I don't use him much as he's just not my style normally, but he's again very solid. For him, one of the odder issues is the sluggishness of the UI. If you gain or lose a lot of stacks quickly, it can take a while for the UI to catch up. Sure, there's the workaround to switch to and from operator mode to refresh it, but my one small change would be to speed up the animation based on how much it has to update. Let's do away with the confusion of workarounds and just know how many stacks you actually have. Then we come to Nova. For her, I'm going to remind you of how we saw her in action in the trailer for the new war. This portal she places for Rhino is definitely no normal portal. My one small change will be to give her functionality similar to this in-game. It wouldn't be the first time a Warframe has gained an ability based on a scene from a trailer, as Mag has had this too. For Nova's portal, on Holdcast, she places a two-way portal on the surface she's looking at. A second cast places the other end, connecting them up for everyone to use. And then a third cast would just replace the first portal to keep it simple. This is literally portal mechanics from the game portal, and I'm dead serious about the idea. Maybe we could also get a cake decoration in the process. Now as for Nyx, she's already powerful. Again, crowd control, tank, and defense reduction abilities put her in a solid place. The downside is that mind control is a bit naff. Sure, you can take over a bad guy and turn him to your side, but it just doesn't have as much oomph for reliability behind it, especially versus Lucania. For Nyx's one small change, I'd have the mind controlled unit copy Nyx's cast of Psychic Bolts in Chaos. This is similar to how Wisp's Will O Wisp will copy casting Breach Surge. Not only would this further improve Nyx's reach with those abilities, it would make the controlled unit more able to kill other nearby units with their defenses gone. As an added bonus to balance, this can't upset the helmet system as other Warframes can use mind control, but not the other abilities from Nyx. As you might figure out from that Nyx idea, I'm a fan of synergy. However, Oberon is a poor example of it. Unlike Harrow's natural synergy due to his abilities working together, or Zephyr's forced but optional synergy between Airburst and Tornado, 
Oberon Synergy is required to access relatively basic parts of its kit. Allies will only get the armor buff if they're under the Renewal effect and stand on hallowed ground, while enemies only get the armor reduction debuff if they're both struck by Reckoning and again stood on hallowed ground. My one small change will be to decouple these requirements. Oberon's in a difficult position with ability creep and changing metas, so a little less forced synergy would move to make him more enticing to use. Following on from Oberon, we go from a frame who struggles to do enough to one who has just so much going on. Octavia has Metronome as her third ability, which will grant her and her allies armor, as well as the potential for a multi-shot bonus, an invisibility bonus, a melee damage bonus, a movement speed bonus, and her passive activates for an energy regen bonus. Suffice to say, a lot is happening in that one ability cast. The problem for most of the buffs is that with so much going on, not to mention your own actions if you're not the Octavia, I'd wager many players just ignore some of these buffs outright. Sure, a little crouch spam never hurt anyone, but shooting on the beat, melee on the beat, jumping on the beat, a beat which is customized player to player, just doesn't gel. My one small change will be that whenever Octavia activates one of those buffs, it is immediately applied to all allies in range as well. She knows her music more than anyone and can trigger all the buffs for everyone else this way. The others in the squad will still retain the ability to trigger the buffs independently for themselves if Octavia is taking a break from doing squats. Next, Protea. Protea is a pretty solid Warframe, again with a collection of support, control, defense, and damage abilities, which suit her quite well. Her fourth ability, Temporal Anchor, is situational, though there is definitely some power to be gained from using the stat reset it has, effectively allowing for free energy, health, and ammo. I'll be honest, this seems a bit of a mismatch, considering Dispensary already gives out energy, health, and ammo, but I'm not a Protea main, so I can't speak with absolute authority there. Instead, my one small change will be to how it works on taking fatal damage. Currently, it'll send you back, but also leave you with just 5% health, rather than whatever your save state was. I'd make it so you'd be returned back to the save state, just like if the ability was manually recast, just at the moment of taking lethal damage. You're already losing out on the remaining duration on Temporal Anchor, so this is just a little something to make it a bit less punishing on an already less favoured ability. Now, Revenant is another of those Warframes where his kit pretty much just works. Oh sure, the damage from his 4th ability doesn't scale into Steel Path as strongly as it did in lower levels, but he's still plenty capable to the point that most changes would be needlessly overpowered. My one small change to him would be to adjust his passive ability, which currently knocks down nearby enemies when his shields run out. Let's have this also trigger on running out of Mesmer skin charges too. This would make his passive a little bit more relevant, and give just a bit more grace when Mesmer skin runs out. It's a tiny change but most Reverend players will rarely run out of shields anyway compared to running out of Mesmer skin, so at least they'll get something out of the passive. Similar to Revenant, we have Rhino. I say similar, they both have a skin ability which tanks like, well, a tank. Rhinos 2, 3 and 4 are all in good places overall, so my attention is brought to his first ability, Rhino Charge. It's not exactly a high meta ability in itself, but it does give you a burst of movement forward. My one small change will be to double down on this movement by maintaining the momentum from this charge once the ability ends. You know, similar to the change Revenant got to Reeve just last year with the release of Revenant Prime. I feel this extra fluidity could make it feel a little smoother and have a place beyond damage alone. Now for the polar opposite of these two tanks, we've got Saren. She's a damage powerhouse, capable of killing through abilities alone, or she can become a weapons platform to devastating effect. Spores are fine, Miasma is fine, Toxic Lash is fine, and Molt? Molt's where the change is at. You see, this ability has two timers, one for maximum duration of Molt itself, and a much shorter one for the duration of the speed boost. My one small change will be to add this second timer somewhere into the UI. It's a little change, purely quality of life, but it would be nice to actively see how long it has to last, rather than just feeling the speed difference from one moment to the next. We're about halfway through, so I'm just going to take this moment to suggest you follow me on Twitch as well for live streams three days a week. Next, we have Severgoth. Being locked behind Railjack, having a high form investment to max out, and otherwise offering up his most powerful ability to the helmet system, it seems to me he just gets rather overlooked. But this video is all about the small changes, so let's keep it small. My one small change will be to bring him in line with other Warframes that have exalted vehicles? I don't think that's the best description, but basically I'm referring to the likes of Hildren, Titania, and Eureli, who all have abilities to change them from normal Warframe movement to whatever weirdness they have going on, be it hovering, 
flight, skating, or in Sevigov's case, a kind of spirit projection. All the others can swap to operator mode while maintaining their other form, but Sevigov transformed out of shadow form on using transference. Let's do away with that one, allow you to keep shadow form active while in operator. This could open up more synergy or combos between the two, especially with the melee focused Naramon school. Rather new to the game, we have Steinax. He's not a bad frame at all, having again control, energy generation, defense reduction that works even against Steel Path treasurers, just to name a few traits. So the one small change for Steinax isn't game changing, but it is fix reverting. Let's make Final Stand recastable in the air again, like on release. We currently have to land before we can recast this ability due to Hotfix 3205. I read the hotfix. I see the note about how you could just stay in the air permanently, casting the ability with the right setup. That said, given how many frames can constantly do all kinds of shenanigans with the right setup, I just don't see the issue. Let us have this one. Speaking of frames who can spend the entire mission in the air while delivering huge amounts of damage, we now turn our attention to Titania. As that introduction might suggest, she's pretty powerful. Stasis immunity, full three-dimensional flight, and pistols with the power to rival most automatic weapons. And then there's one ability which, I'd wager, most players would struggle to fully identify. Her tribute ability has four separate effects, granting damage reduction and reflection, enemy accuracy debuff, companion damage health and armor buff, and enemy speed debuff. My one small change would be to give this the Grendel Nourish treatment. Strip away the fluff, take out the cycle aspect, and turn it into a single ability. If this would end up being too powerful as an all-in-one, I don't think most people would miss the enemy accuracy debuff. As it stands, it's the same effect as 5 blast procs, and let's be real, no one's pushing for a blast status build in Warframe. Playing in an entirely different manner, we have Trinity. The ultimate support frame, she can deliver 100% healing to the whole squad with a single cast, all the while applying damage reduction to everyone. I can make use of all four of her abilities with different builds and circumstances, so there's no meddling that needs to happen there. Instead for her one small change, let's look at her passive. Trinity's passive is focused on reviving, with the amazing ability to revive from slightly further away and slightly faster. It's not great. So here, I'm taking a leaf out of a different game's book, Apex Legends. The archetypal support character there, Lifeline, has a passive ability to set a drone to revive allies, leaving her free to keep on fighting. Let's bring that to Warframe, whether you're reviving your companion, your ally, or even a defense operative. One quick tap, and the revive completes itself, while you focus on the mission. Just a small change to round off the support factor. On to Valkyr. I'll admit right now that my first instinct with her would be something to do with Ripline. Not remove it, but do more of it. However, I've been swayed by the comments from Valkyr mains that beg to look at an even more forgettable ability, Paralysis. The name is basically a lie. It does a modest amount of damage based on your shields lost, and otherwise stuns most enemies for a couple seconds, enough to pull off a finisher or maybe two if you're quick about it. As it's a low cost to cast, I figure a longer base paralysis might be overpowered, and it will definitely step onto the augment. Instead, my one small change will be to make the finisher opening permanent, just like Naramon Sling Stun. Finishers aren't the most optimal way to kill enemies, but they're some of the flashiest moves we can pull off. Next on the roster is Vorban. He's got a lot of control elements, as well as scaling damage and grouping abilities. Most players already know the power of a well-placed Vorban Vortex. However, it is much rarer to see a Vorban use Bastille. Bastille incapacitates enemies by suspending them, rather than grouping them into a pile of ragdolls, and also grants armor to allies inside the zone based on the affected enemies. However, it has a limit on the number of affected enemies at once, with a base of 12 and tied to its strength. Vortex, on the other hand, has no such limit. My one small change will be to take out the enemy limit on this ability then. If dozens of enemies are in range, lift up the dozens of them, just how Vortex will ragdoll all of them. Continuing the V-theme, we get to Vault, our final starter frame in this mini-series. Vault's recently been given some buffs and is in an excellent place at various tiers of play, right the way up to Eidolon hunting. Once you have him at level 30, he's a perfectly good Warframe. Prior to level 30, however, there is an issue. Vault's fourth ability, Discharge, will stun enemies in range and deal electricity damage to other enemies near the stunned ones. After four and a half seconds of being stunned, the affected targets then also start dealing damage to themselves. That's all fine and dandy if the stun lasts for more than four and a half seconds. Upon unlocking the Discharge ability, and even on getting it to rank one, the base stun duration is shorter than the damage delay, 
meaning that in lower enemy density missions, especially the ones that newer players find themselves in, Vault's 4th ability can end up dealing no damage at all, even to a level 1 Butcher. My one small change will be to flatten the stun duration to 6 seconds regardless of ability level. It has other stats like damage which will still climb with level, but at the very least there won't be new players casting their 100 energy ultimate ability and watching it somehow do no damage. Last of the Vs is Varuna. I've already covered how complicated but effective she is as a Warframe with an incredible array of features. One feature on her however is a little odd. Varuna's fourth available passive gives her protection from lethal damage, going onto a 60 second cooldown when triggered. That in itself is fine, choosing between her other passives or this death ward. What's odd however is that this passive also goes onto cooldown if you simply switch to a different option. In effect, swapping into the death protection locks you into it, but swapping out means it's gone for a while despite being unused. So there's my one small change then, only applying the cooldown if Runa's passive actually saves her from death, not when just switching to another perk. Up next we have Wisp, a highly played, highly effective Warframe. She's got a very strong first, second and third ability, but her fourth, Soulgate, is unfortunately lagging behind a bit. Fully scaled up, it can theoretically reach 99,000 DPS before strength modifiers. However, this requires her to have beamed the same target for 5 seconds already for damage ramp up, as well as being fixed to heat and radiation damage. It also has a base cost of 12 energy per second, or 24 when using the supercharged firing mode. For comparison, Mace's Peacemaker ability has a base strain of just 15 energy per second, and can be modded to whatever damage type you like. My one small change will be to remove the damage ramp up mechanic of Soulgate, buffing up the base damage and boosted damage to the ramped up levels. This is after all the power of the sun being portaled in, and I don't remember seeing the Grenier factories making any sunscreen. This brings us on to Wukong, one of a select number of Warframes to have received a targeted nerf in recent times. To be fair, his clone is amazing, his Cloud Walker ability is actually S tier, and Defy isn't too shabby for damage reduction. Where Wukong is let down is his Iron Staff. Oh sure, stats wise it's not terrible on paper, but it's just not amazing enough to justify spending the energy on. One of the reasons for this is it can't be as strongly modded as other melee weapons. My one small change would give Iron Staff the ability to use the so called Acolyte mods, crucially Blood Rush and Weeping Wounds. This would allow it to scale up closer to what we expect from the rest of our arsenal. Ok for Zaku, I'm going to keep this brief. Their kit works, every ability has its place, and while there are changes here and there that could be made to the abilities, that's not important enough. The one small change here is simple, let's have a toggle option to not yeet our entire body off when using the vast and time. I don't care what submenu this toggle ends up in, this change is for the fashion framers. Our penultimate frame on this list is Yureli. I very recently done a guide on her, yes that April Fools video is staying as the actual guide to her. One of the issues I called out in that guide is the 4th ability Riptide shrinks down its grab range over the first 2 seconds on an already line of sight restricted ability. My one small change will be to not throw away that range quite so quickly. Sure maybe drop it down over time like Limbo's Cataclysm shrinks, but losing basically all the range in a couple seconds is rough for this ultimate ability. And finally we have our girl Zephyr. In case you hadn't noticed, Zephyr's strong. Total bullet and projectile deflection, constant crit bonus whilst airborne, multiple crowd control abilities, and tornadoes turning all damage into AoE. So for her, the one small change I'd make is to a hold cast on Tailwind, her first ability. Currently, this gives you a hovering form of movement which is great for the passive, but has even less mobility than Hildren's Aegis Storm. I'd instead like to see Zephyr get full 3 dimensional movement just like Titania. She doesn't need the speed of the pixie, not at all, but it'd be nice to have the freedom to actively move around vertically as well as horizontally. So from UI adjustments, to cap removals, to lifting an idea straight out of a battle royale, what's your favourite idea in this part 2 video? In any case, that's all from me for now, so as always, dream big, get buffs, and fight well Tenno.